Cairo, Seattle. It's time to get schooled with a professor, John Clayton. Welcome to Schooled with a Professor. Today's topic is a general manager in training camp. As it gets close to the season, what is going through the minds of the GMs and how do they try to handle things? And joining us right now, former general manager of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Mark Dominic, colleague of mine. And Mark, is this a good time of the year? Is it a tough time of the year? Where would you rank this as far as the timing of this year in comparison to what the job is of a general manager? You know, honestly, I think, John, it's the busiest time of the year in a short, condensed area, meaning, you know, you prepare for the draft and you have months to get to that great couple days of, of drafting your first round or your seventh rounder, but you have a lot of time to build that up. When you're in this spot, it's instantaneously next-minute decisions, meaning you're trying to decide who's going to play in the third preseason game, how long you're going to play, who's going to start in some clubs in terms of the quarterback, or who's the, who's the backup left tackle and how much reps do you want to get him just because you're worried of a possible injury. So there's so much moving going on here, as well as thinking about cutting the team down to 53, adding your 10 practice squad players. John, you know, it, it's a very, very busy time of the year. I think it's the busiest time of the year and the most important time of the year for the general manager. Is it tougher or easier now there's going to be one cut instead of two? One of the changes this year is that they would always go after the third preseason game. You then cut your roster from 90 to 75. This year, that's not the case. Uh, you go from 90 to 53, and that's right after the fourth preseason game. Is that uh, a good rule? Does it make it tougher? What, what does that do for a general manager? Well, I personally was a, a favor of it. I spoke to other general managers or former colleagues of mine that, that weren't as, as, as happy about that, but I like it because, I, number one, it helps you get to that final preseason game, the fourth preseason game, and give the young players you were going to cut a chance to still have one more chance to shine. So instead of the early cut from 90 to 75 before the fourth game, now 90 guys or however many you want to take into the final preseason game can get you through the game, and you never know. Maybe there's a player that you thought – was a fringe guy you were thinking about your practice squad that comes to that game and has seven tackles or catches four balls for a touchdown, and you're like, you know what? He's a little bit better than I thought. Let's not risk him on the practice squad. I mean, remember, Arian Fosters of the world started their career on practice squads and then got claimed. I mean, I claimed Donald Penn off of the Vikings practice squad, and he started 10 straight years at left tackle. So that one extra game could help you make a big decision. I like it. Yeah, but, of course, that's the one thing that – in fact, if you're, if you're a good team, how many players do you think you know are going to be on your forty, uh, your fifty man, fifty-three man roster at this time as you head into the third preseason game? Yeah, you know, it's it's, it's a majority of it, right? You, you've got to pretty much figure it out, I think, when you're looking at your team just in general at that point of who you're gonna who you're gonna keep. I mean, if you're a really good team, uh, out of your fifty-three, you're probably got fifty-one, I think, guys on the roster already. Uh, and then, you know, out of the 63 total, when you add the 10 practice squad players, I would say you've got probably 58 or 59. You don't need to make a lot of changes, but you still shouldn't be afraid to do it, right? I mean, I still think, you know, you can't be content. You can't tell me. And I always felt this, and I challenged my scouts this way, and I even talked to our head coach this way. There's no way we have the 63 best players on this team today. Like, we may have 58 best players, but there's got to be five other players out there that we can do better than. And uh, it was a constant challenge that I put to our team and our and our scouts. Now, if it's a bad team, how many do you think that you know that are going to be on your 53? Because obviously, as you've seen with Cleveland and teams that are at the top of the draft, you know they're always going to be bringing in five, six guys on waiver claims that on the final cut. Yeah, yeah you know, John, when I look at that, I think there's still, still about 43. Because the one thing about a bad team, and you've got to have patience with, is the draft picks that you made on that team. You've got to sit there and have the patience to let them play that out. And maybe a year two guy that you're not sure he's really got it, let's give him one more season to make sure that, you know, during the season and through extra coaching that he might develop a little bit further. So I look at that and say you're probably at 40 to 43 with 10 spots being candidly better. But two or three of those are guys, you know, what you're kind of going to give a hall pass to and say, I'm going to give them one more season, one more off season. We'll put them here. I uh, may not dress him, but I don't want to lose lose touch with him because we didn't invest the draft pick in him, or maybe it was a college free that showed something to you. So I still think there you're looking at probably 10 to 12 players that you should be looking for rather than a good team that's looking for five by five. But, of course, 
injuries play a big factor in the decisions because sometimes you can get hit in one area with injuries. And of course, uh, you don't know when some guys are going to be back. I mean, so for example, on Friday night, uh, John Snyder sitting there at uh, Century Link, and all of a sudden George Fant goes down with an ACL, a player that was expected to be the starting left tackle, forces him then to go make a trade for Matt Tobin, the uh, offensive lineman from the Philadelphia Eagles. How much? What, as a, take us through a process that you can see, like a John Snyder doing things like that, or any general manager when you get a significant injury. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing you do is what we called squares, and I learned that from Bruce Allen, a former gym manager, obviously well-known and worked in the league for so many years. I mean, he taught me a thing called squares, and we kind of worked on it before, but what hit was, was you have obviously 31 other teams, and you have the AFC, the NFC, and the job and the goal to me of your director of pro or maybe your director of player is to call all 31 clubs as we're going through the preseason. So you don't have to be – you could be reactionary – uh, you don't have to be concerned or, or worried about what the choice is. You should be able to look and see that list. So what you would do is you turn around and you, you call the director of pro or the director of player at the other clubs, and you say, hey, look, we've got some depth at this position. We are weak here. Is there anybody you would consider moving? And you kind of mark that. And then every other day I would call the guys in and say, give me the update on the squares. What's going on around the league to get a sense? So when this happens to John Schneider in a game, at least you can kind of look and say, you know what? I talked to three three teams out of the 31 other teams. They all said they had a little bit of depth at the offensive line spot. Let's turn around and let's take a look at those teams a little bit harder and who it might be. And then I think the other thing you've got to remind yourself when you're in that situation is what's the worst thing another team can say is no. So don't be afraid to go and say, hey, look, maybe we call the Cleveland Browns about Joe Thomas one more time. What's the worst thing they can say? No? Okay. But if you feel like you're that type of team like John has in Seattle, that's a conversation I think you just have to have regardless of what you think the outcome's going to be. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's the tough part that Seattle faces right now is that they thought they had the left side of the line figured out. You know, they had Luke Jokel at uh, left guard, and Tom Cable seems to like him at left guard, and Fant had won the left tackle job. So now they have to take Reese Odiombo, a third-round pick who has tackle experience in college but not much in the NFL, and see if he can do it. And so it's like, okay, so you make the move, you pick up Matt Tobin, you think that you can see if it's going to work. If it doesn't work with Odiombo, then you can take Jokel and move him to left tackle, but then you have to go into to the next phase, which I guess would be the squares to say, okay, this isn't working. We can go for maybe a Joe Thomas, a Dwayne Brown who's holding out with Houston, Donald Penn, who you know very well with the Oakland Raiders, make those calls, but then that causes major ramifications on your roster. It does, and that's a decision you have to make again. I think you got to look at your football team, like you said. What's your depth already on your team? Where's your salary cap and where's it sit? And how good is your realistic chance being candid with yourself of making a real run this year. If you feel like your team's like a fringe team and you've been a seven and nine team or eight and eight, you're like, hey, look, if we do this really good, we might be able to make a wild card and make a run for it in the postseason. That's great. But if you're a six and ten team and you're struggling through it, then it gets a little bit harder for you to sit there and say, do we invest the resources and the money, knowing that we're going to need this money down the line at some other point to really become a better football team, and maybe we just need to develop somebody or steal some guys off a of private squad and hopefully have our coaching staff coach somebody up. Yeah, but take it, explain the salary cap in the sense that, for example, Seattle has about $8 million left under the cap. You know, they make the trade for Matt Tobin. He only costs about $850,000, which is uh, you know, a little bit of a bargain because he has 21 starts. But it's not $8 million. Because what happens now, you take the top 51 players, and that's what currently counts. But when you get to the start of the regular season, then everything counts. And so how do you try to budget for a team like Seattle and others that are at $8 million, knowing that you have to put in a practice squad? That's a million dollars. You know, so it's like it's eight, but it's not really eight. No, it's not really eight. And you've got to sit there and look. What we would do in Tampa Bay when I was the general manager there is we would focus – and forecast out four seasons more. So whether we're living in 17 now, you're looking at 18, 19, 20, and 21. And so you're automatically plugging 1 million, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3 for the practice squad. You're already plugging in, let's say we're picking 16th just to be safe in the draft at every, every slot. You're plugging that in. And then you've got to look at, like you said, you take a, a, a salary of a player that's a significant salary, and you go ahead and add him in, and you realize the ramifications that has maybe not in 18, it's certainly in 19 and 20. And so that's why you've got to be really candid with your with your position of your team and say, is it now the time to go get the veteran 
and the experienced guy that's got a lot of talent, or is it better now to just go with the young guy and find somebody off the practice squad or develop our own because of where we sit and realizing that, hey, you know what, in a couple of years from now, I need the money for this player we just drafted, and I don't want to waste it all now. Knowing that the left tackle position is so important, at what sacrifice do you make to the rest of the roster? I mean, for example, if you pick up like a Donald Penn or you pick up a Dwayne Brown or even a Joe Thomas, then all of a sudden you have to go either to some vets and ask them for pay cuts or just let them go. So like the ramification would be Seattle would probably have to trade Jeremy Lane, who has a $4 million guaranteed base, may have to let Atiba Rubin go, who's a defensive tackle, and then maybe not be able to keep Jermaine Curse, who's got a $2 million base salary. And so uh, at what point does one position wreck what you might have for depth on the rest of your team? Yeah, it can. And and that's where you've got to, again, I think you've got to look at each position individually. And I think that's what you did. That's what John did in Seattle. I think you've seen that around the league. You can identify maybe eight, maybe nine players on your team, including the quarterback, and realize that's your core. And the other decisions are going to be ones you're going to really not like to have to make, but you're going to have to let guys walk. And we've seen that in Seattle. You've seen that they've let guys like Brandon Meebane, who've been you know, great players and great teammates and hard guys to sit there and walk out the door, but you realize he's not part of the pure core of why we think we can win a championship here in Seattle. So when you make these decisions, you've got to look at those core guys and say, how will it affect those core players? And can I make sure I keep them regardless or in, in a situation of adding a veteran player in this kind of situation? And if, it, if it halters that or hurts that, that's another way to check yourself to say maybe this isn't the time to do it. Yeah, I mean, different uh, teams and different general managers view things differently as far as, I go. for example, saw a lot of teams like to use blue players, which would be the elite players, and uh, that would be the main core of your team. If I don't know, were you into the blue category, or how did you kind of define elite players or good players on a core group team? Yeah, we had different colors, but we used the same thing. I think a lot of people have, have, have taken some of the, the scouting services that are available out there, one that's very famous is Mike Giddings and all the work that he's done in terms of scouting players. We had a green player because to me, green means go. Like this is the guy that's a top go player. And maybe you had shades of green in terms of the eliteness of that player, but that's the way we looked at it. So we would look at elite players in the same mindset, mindset and you're trying to acquire six to eight elite players. And if you have that, and then specifically, obviously a quarterback, you're going to be a team that has a chance every year. So, so is it six to eight players, or is it more players that can form a championship caliber team? Oh, I think, I mean, I think honestly, it's, it's, number one, it's always going to be and always will be the quarterback right. and the impact that it has on your team. But after that, I think if you have six to eight blue players, you've got a pretty darn talented roster there with a quarterback that's at least in that range. You've got a chance to be, a, a, I think you're the Green Bay Packers, right? You're in the postseason every year. It just depends on how good you're going to be overall. You know, how good are your team players? How many do you have? And, and are you going to have some luck that rolls your way in the game? And if you don't have enough of those blue players, then you're going to be that 10 and 6, make the postseason, but you're going to get kicked out way too often. Yeah. Well, I guess as a as a coach, they he has the luxury of just pretty much concentrating on what's immediately ahead. What do I need to do to get this team ready for the next week? Unfortunately for the general manager, it never stops because, I mean, it's a 365-day worrisome job because, one, you have to worry about the long-term and the short-term. And, of course, in a case of a yep. team like Seattle, maybe to a certain degree Green Bay, you know, age starts to creep in. And how do you start to factor that in? For example, Seattle now has seven Pro Bowl players on defense, and they have about seven or eight guys that are making $10 million a year or more. At what point do you start as a general manager to think, okay – Here's the ages where I got to start worrying about eventually replacing these top players. Usually it's 31, 32. And this is where I think it gets interesting when you have players that start to look at their deal, want to tear it up and reset the deal again because they don't feel like it's market value. And that's a dangerous road you start going down because those other six or seven players that are blue players or green players on your team are all watching that scenario play out going, hey, if he can do it two years early, then next year I've got two years left. I'm going to hold out, and I'm going to have the same issue. Now you're compounding the problem. So I think when you look at an age perspective, John, it's usually that 30, 31, 32 range is where you get a little leery, except for obviously certain positions where you feel like you can get away with that, i.e. quarterback. But other than that, that's usually that, that drop-off where you say, after I get a player to that 32-year-old, it's not probably the best time to give them a third big contract because the odds are – uh, you know, it's going to be hard for him to play through that. How daunting is a task of trying to uh, to figure that out? Because, again, it's fi- figuring out, okay, here's the player that I had. 
And then you have to almost justify that player that we are going to have replace him may not be as good. Yeah, no, that's daunting. I mean, you got to realize that's why the draft is important, and, and they draft all the way through, as you know, seven rounds because you're still looking for that maybe that that fan left tackle that you know maybe not was the first round prospect, but everybody liked, and, and now you got a chance to steal him and you, you plug him up, and that's why you have coaches. I mean, the idea is for them to develop players, and some guys can only develop into a special teams player, some guys can end up developing into a starter. But that's the whole idea of, of using so much time towards the draft to be able to find the Richard Shermans in the fifth round that make a difference. Mm-hmm. And, of course, uh, I guess what's even tougher now is the uh, the vast differences in the contracts because contracts are jumping up, you know, particularly for starting players at such a high level. It's kind of killed the middle class. But for the starter players, I mean, all of a sudden, guards now make $12 million a year. Centers now can make 9 to $10 million a year. Top defensive players make 18 to $20 million a year, making negotiations tough for the general manager trying to get the cap guy to get this thing done. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's, it's the ball's rolling downhill, and that's where it goes back to identifying only a certain amount of core players on your team, and realizing that's who you're going to keep. And if you feel like the left guard is one of those guys, and it's a Steve Hutchinson type of player, then you go do it. But if it's not that type of guy, you've got to just understand you got to let him go, take the compensatory pick, and keep moving. Yeah, and then finally, when you have a quarterback that's paid well, which of course in this league most quarterbacks are paid well, but how what's that difficult jump from when you have the quarterback that you draft, have him for four years at a reasonably good price? What's the adjustment once you start to have to pay that quarterback twenty one, twenty two to twenty five million dollars, and how you adjust your thinking as a general manager? Well, I think the big thing that what changes there is you have to be even more and more aggressive about your late round picks. And this time of year, where we're talking about what we started the program with here, the 53-man cutdown, and the fact that you've got to be aggressive there to use the cutdown as a way to build the back of your roster to get low salary players into your football team and take take advantage of other teams' practice squad or your own in developing players. But I think when you have the quarterback being paid, you have to even be that much more diligent about finding young players that can plug in so you can afford to keep them all. Hey, Mark Dominic, thanks for educating us up on what it's like to be a general manager at a very difficult time of the year. John Clayton, thanks for having me on, my friend. Good to talk to you. I'll talk to you soon. And that does it for this week's podcast. In between episodes, you can follow me on Twitter at Clayton ESPN. If you enjoy these weekly one-on-one conversations, consider leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to the show. Thanks for listening. See you next time on Schooled with the Professor. 